I want to spend a few minutes thinking about evidence for evolution. We're going to come back to all of these things in micro and macro evolution. In particular, we'll focus on a lot of these processes in macro evolution, which is equivalent to speciation. So how much change has to occur in order for a species to become different and isolated? So we'll look at this. <clears throat> This is a trilobite, for those of you who may be familiar with this fossil. Um, for this fossil, many of them are found actually in Ohio and the Midwest, huge numbers of them. This one's about 370 million years old, but are often found in rock strata and are dated by a process known as radioactive decay that we'll talk more about later. But when we look at this, um, this fossil in particular was actually found in, in Morocco, if you're interested. Um, but many of them today can be found simply by digging in, in rocks near road cutouts. They're very popular places to look for fossils where they've cut out for highways. But what we want to think about is how this trilobite might have changed over time. We're not going to focus on this in great depth, but what we look at with the trilobite as, is a key example of a fossil record organism. There are no living species of trilobites. So when we talk about trilobites, we talk about them as being extinct. We can also talk about extant species. An extant species is one that is still alive. Okay, But trilobites are all extinct. So we, are, we only have the fossil record to work with. This will be different for different species for us, um, but we can look at, at how they've changed simply by looking at a fossil record. And you see, we'll talk more about phylogenetic trees later, but on this one, this organism is actually evolutionarily the oldest. And this one is evolutionarily the youngest. So when we look at these, we've mentioned before that older organisms tend to be more simple. Would you consider this organism on the right to be more simple than the organism on the left? Probably. We'll look at things like gradual modification. Evolution is not fast. This is not a process that goes very quickly. It is a process that goes painfully slowly. So what we have to think about is how we can use extinct in fossils and extant species to better understand relationships. So we can compare present day species that we know what they look like, we know their structures, and we can compare them to organisms that are now extinct. So we'll do that. We'll look at fossil records and so on. We'll look at something known as comparative morphology. What is morphology? It's what you look like, right? It's your structures, it's characteristics of your skeleton, and so on. In this example, I show you a comparison between a whale, a cat, a bat, and a gorilla. Well, you might not think that those things have anything in common whatsoever, but we'll look at the idea that they're all mammals, and they have a very similar forelimb structure. So front leg. Now, no, a whale and a bat don't have a front leg per se, but they have a modified front limb, and all of them fall into this one, two, five characteristic. So meaning they have one bone, two bones, and five distinct bone structures associated with these parts, and they have them color-coded here for you to see. We'll talk about this more with evolution as well, and we're putting together what we call phylogenies, or evolutionary relationships. These homologous structures become very important for understanding evolution, and homologous evolution refers to the idea of the same structure with a different function. While you might be a good swimmer, you are certainly not the same swimmer as a whale, 
I can bet a whale is going to outswim you. I can also bet that a bat will outfly you and a cat will outclimb you and probably outrun you, right? So when we look at these structures, the underlying morphology or structure is the same, but their function is now different. And we'll think about that and why it's important. We can also look at something known as comparative embryology. So again, comparing the embryos of different organisms. Here, comparing a chicken and a human. And we'll look at this idea in more detail later on. A couple of characteristics they point out to you here are a postanal tail. You had a tail as an embryo. Proof in the pudding right here, OK? Um, but we also had something known as pharyngeal pouches. Now, in some organisms, these pharyngeal pouches would become associated with gills and breathing apparati in aquatic animals. But in humans and chickens, where we're not underwater, they actually become associated with ear structures. So we'll look at that. Today, very little comparative embryology and morphology is actually done. We're very reliant on molecular biology to study evolution, so comparing DNA. We've talked in the past about DNA and gene structures and some of them as being very conservative. Do you remember what that meant? If things were conservative, it meant that we maintained them in many different species. So what we look for are common DNA codes, common DNA sequence, and how those codes and sequence are actually shared between generations and then between different species. So we can then plot that out, essentially, and look at changes in the organism structures and characteristics over time independent of those commonalities. So we look at common DNA structures. So there's some common link between all of these organisms. Okay, In this case, these are all vertebrates, right? They all have a vertebrae. So when we look at these things known as derived characters, they're marked here for you in these red numbers. Okay. But when we look at these derived characters, what we're suggesting is that every time you see one of these numbers, there's a new characteristic that has separated these organisms from one another. So, so even though our ostrich and our hawks and other birds down here are common in that they are birds of a kind, right? They both have feathers, but ostriches no longer fly. So what we have to think about is what characteristic has separated them that the ostrich no longer flies, but hawks and other birds do. We'll also look at how closely related crocodiles and birds are, so our link between reptiles and birds. We'll look at other links, how we're associated between mammals and amphibians and so on. We can look at literally DNA sequence. So this is actually sequence um, for a gene region known as CO1 or cytochrome oxidase 1. This gene sequence is very, very short. Um, it's actually about 300 base pairs of DNA or 100 amino acids. And what they're telling you here is in a 300 base pair DNA sequence, it's short, very short, but it's also highly conserved. Because when we look at this, there is only a 13 base pair difference between you and a pig. So figure out that ratio. 13 out of 300 gives you what percentage? That's how, in this gene region, how different you are from a pig. Now, in other gene regions, you're very different from a pig. But in this one, very conserved. Um, our yeast, 66 base pairs different. Now, yes, that's significant, 66 out of 300 base pairs between you and a yeast. But still, you share then 234 base pairs identical to yeast. I don't think you compared yourself to yeast recently. Okay. Now, these are what we refer to as phylogenetic trees or evolutionary trees. And what I want to point out to you is Darwin was actually the first to suggest this. This 
tree or branching structure gives you an idea of relationships. That's all we're doing, is forming relationships. So Darwin writes, I think. He knew nothing of DNA. He knew nothing of how these underlying molecular processes worked, but he did know that somehow we're all related on a big old family tree. We'll also look at experimental evidence associated with evolution. So we'll look at this idea that an increasing number of predators, so this is high predation at the bottom of my figure here, low predation at the top, can actually change how a prey item looks. So if all of these guppies are prey items, it means that somebody else wants to eat them, right? Well, if you want to hide from a predator, how are you going to do it? Are you going to be big and flashy? I don't think so. You're going to try to blend into your environment. All right. So we'll look at this and, and how it impacts um, natural selection. So how this all ties into natural selection. We'll also look at artificial selection briefly. I've mentioned this to you before. Um, this showing you an example, an agricultural example instead of a dog breed example. But the idea is still the same. You're starting out with a single individual, in this case wild mustard, and you're selecting particular traits through artificial selection. So you are selecting, or someone is selecting these traits that are appealing in some way and developing these new lines. And I know for many of you, getting from wild mustard to broccoli is a big jump. Okay, And we're not going to focus on all of the intermediate details of getting from wild mustard to broccoli. But I want to show you that all of these things that we think about um, can lead us back to a common a common ancestor. And so when we look at artificial selection or natural selection, our goal is going to be constantly to turn around and say, OK, where did this come from? And that's going to be our big focus in, in microevolution and macroevolution in the coming lectures.